somebody. And who is definite to die tomorrow or day after tomorrow? Will you marry that person? No. Will you marry that person? No. Why? Because it will cause me suffering. The other people also more or less similar. <laughs> They're also going to die any time. They're also impermanent. Mm -hmm. On a larger scale. You see? So what I'm again I'm not saying don't marry. <laughs> what I'm saying is if you have that wisdom, that understanding, there will be less attachment. If there's less attachment and more understanding about the fragility of this human life, you'll be more compassionate to what other person. For example, if you're somebody who has really suffered much, who has become sick and ill, and a lot of experience, so generally speaking, that person, when you see some other people who are suffering and sick, that person is able to, generally speaking, show more understanding, because you know what it means to be suffer, to suffer, you see. But if you're somebody who has no knowledge, then you will not care about the sickness or illness of that other person. Yes, I give, had given you the example of the three criminals. When you see impermanence, when you see, understand that inevitable death and so forth, then you will develop more understanding. Just as we had developed more compassion and love with these three people. So with your, your, your husband and wife, your brothers, sisters, your children also, you will develop more genuine love and affection. Because now you have the understanding that today we are living together as husband and wife, brothers, and sisters, and so forth. But I am impermanent, they are impermanent. Right now they are healthy, I am healthy, but somebody who is healthy doesn't mean that he or she will not die any time, you know. It can be any time. I am saying any time. Death is definite. Time of death is indefinite, unfortunately. Although in today's world we are very fond of making appointments. Three o'clock meeting with somebody, five o'clock meeting with somebody. But the, the Lord of death will not seek your appointment. <laughs> when do you prefer to die? Okay, tell me. Three o'clock? Okay. He will not do that. <laughs> it, can, it can come any time. It come any time. So once you have that understanding, then naturally you will see, you will develop more affection to your relatives and families. There will be less attachment. You know that, okay, this, in this life they are my relatives and friends and so forth because of past life karma, whatever be the situation. So we need to really live together nicely with, with, with affection, genuine love, and more importantly, helping that person do something good so that he or she does not have to suffer in the future, in the next lives. That's the best gift you can give, guiding them, lead a proper way of life. You see? For example, if I'm living with somebody, then tomorrow or day after tomorrow I'm living, they will be particularly nice to me. You see? Because now he's very soon going, you see? So before you go, let us have a, you know, lunch or dinner or something, whatever, you say nice things, you see. So like that, while you live together, you, you know that this person is going soon with any time. So while we live together, be nice. But do we do that? No. Because we have that developed that grasping of permanence. Okay, so after the honeymoon is over, then you are not so nice to each other, you see. And when that person dies, then you cry, useless. <laughs> Crocodile tear, I call it. <laughs> really, we are like small kids. And the Buddha addresses us by saying, my children. My children means that you may have earned a degree, professor, whatever, you know, great musician, whatever. But from his perspective, we are still committing, you know, wrong things, just like small innocent children, you see, not knowing what is good for you in the long run. So therefore he, he says, oh, children, you know. 
So like that. So that's why this kind of understanding of the reality, impermanence, now you can see, is so important. So important. And then similarly, understanding, you know, seeing suffering as happiness, suffering as happiness. Much of the thing that we do in our life only leads to suffering, but still we think that is the source for happiness. And we don't even have any idea about some of the sufferings as suffering. We'll see them as happiness. If you are a student of economics, there is an economical term called law of marginal utility. Law of marginal utility. That means when you enjoy and use these economical products, there is a limit you can enjoy, not beyond that. For example, if you are hungry, you can eat one plate of rice or chapati or vegetable, whatever. But still, if you keep on, you know, feeding yourself, keep on eating, then you will start Vomiting. That's called law of marginal utility. <laughs> <laughs> so, what you thought a source of happiness very soon changes into problem. Now, especially in today's world, you know how many people are suffering from obesity? Like chocolate cake. Exactly. But if you don't like chocolate cake, give it to me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. So, so that's the problem. So, we suffer because of that craving for immediate sense gratification or whatever, not knowing the result it is going to give us. Because we see that as source of happiness. But what it will produce is suffering. Then what is impure is pure. Now our body, is it very pure? If it, if it is very pure, then we don't have to wash so many times, you know. No, no, at all. Yeah, so it's impure. But we don't think it is impure. But we think it's very pure. My body, right? Don't even, <laughs> don't even touch me. You know? <laughs> and because of that, we develop so much grasping to one's own body. Yes. Again, I'm not saying don't take care of your body. Take care. Bye, take care. As I said earlier, you need to take care, of course, but not not because it is, you know, permanent and it is pure, not because of that, but because of this human body, you can do many great things. Mm -hmm. Because of this human mind, you can develop the best compassionate, loving, altruistic mind. No other animals can do that. Because of this possibility, you take care of this body, in that sense. But ordinarily, we misuse the body. And Shanti Deva in his Bodhicharavatara says, Why are you paying so much money for this body? Who is not doing the job, the right job that should be done? <laughs> you see? So therefore, purpose of giving so much to the body is that the body and the mind should be able to do something. That, that will bring long-lasting peace and happiness, not only for this life, but for many lives to come. So therefore, what I was saying was that these misperceptions are the sources of suffering. These afflictive emotions are the sources of suffering, and particularly, as I said, the three, hatred, attachment, and ignorance. Now you can clearly see in the case of hatred, when you develop hatred, <coughs> then that mind is saying, oh. the nature of that emotion, hatred, is Rejection, repulsion. I don't like you, get lost. Go away. You see? Get lost. Or I will eliminate you. Get lost. This is how you deal with other people, other sending beings. I don't want to live in harmony with you, you get lost. Otherwise, I will kill you, banish you, harm you. So you can easily see that how bad such a negative emotion is. You are not saying, let us live together, <coughs> let, let us be friend. You are not saying it, but you are saying, get lost. 
rejection, discrimination, or segregation in terms of races, whatever you say, or even in terms of religion. Now today, unfortunately, in the world, there are many people who, who always say, because I follow this particular religion, that religion is the best in the world. The other religions are wrong. Stupid. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama says that if, some, if somebody asks this question to you, which religion is best in the world? How will you answer this? Yours. Huh? His Holiness said, you cannot say which religion is best. If, if, if they ask you a question, which religion is best to you, then you can answer. Buddhism is best for me. But that does not mean to say Buddhism is best religion. That does not mean to say Buddhism is best for everybody. So Buddhism is best for me, Christianity is best for you, Islam is best for you. So different people have different choices. So therefore there is this concept of plurality of religions. And he gives a very beautiful example by saying that to, to fight in the name of religion is completely out of ignorance and stupidity. And he gives the example by saying, for example, if the family members, they, should, they sit together for, say, lunch or dinner. Now the father says, I like bread. Mother says, I like rice. The children say, we like soup or ice cream. Now under such a situation, if the father says, because I like bread, you all should eat bread. Otherwise, I will beat you. If the mother says the same thing, the children says the same thing, how can the family live together? But normally, you know, in the family, everybody can eat whatever they like. So these different religions are like different foods, different dishes. Let people enjoy whatever they like. And to fight in the name of religion is the most stupid thing. Because number one, religion is supposed to be the best cure for suffering. And if that cure itself becomes poison, so therefore, in this case, I think it's really important that we develop a more kind of pluralistic, pluralistic and universal perspective, a global perspective about the reality by, by seeing what is the purpose of religion. Religion is like, in a way, religion is like politics. We say politics, dirty politics. Politics itself is not necessarily dirty, but when the politicians engage in dirty way, then we say politics is dirty. So similarly, religion also will become dirty. Because if the people who practice religion, they become <laughs> mean and dirty, then religion also also dirty. So therefore, the most important thing is, I think, not religion. The most important thing is spirituality. Spirituality means basic good human qualities, which everybody needs. From wherever, whichever country you come from, you need love, you need affection, you need tolerance, you need patience. So those kind of spiritualities are much more important than religion. And then, if you accept a particular religion, these religions are supposed to strengthen these basic human values. If it is not helping strengthen these basic human values, something is wrong. Even you talk about many invisible things. Buddha up in the sky is asking me to do this. God up in the sky is asking me. People are making it up. So in those cases, the best thing is you use your common sense. You see? So the most important thing is 
the basic human values. Okay. So therefore, in order to develop these basic good human qualities, the most obstructive factor is ignorance, as I said. Now ignorance is of many kinds. One kind of ignorance is just ignorance, means lack of knowledge. So that is normally in Buddhism it is called inborn ignorance. Inborn ignorance. That ignorance is there with you when you were born. So the human beings and animals and birds, we have the same kind of ignorance. Lack of knowledge about many things. So that is called, so okay, that is called inborn ignorance. Okay. The second is called artificial ignorance or imagined ignorance or sometimes I use the word philosophical ignorance. <laughs> Meaning that you also develop certain ignorance because of study, unfortunately. If you, if you study the wrong teaching, wrong text, wrong philosophy, then you also, your mind will go according to that wrong teaching, wrong philosophy, and you will tend to justify it. Unfortunately, it happens. That is very dangerous, because in addition to your inborn ignorance, you also develop some ignorance based on certain artificial knowledge. That's dangerous, because then when you try to stop that ignorant, then you will come up with some reason. The reason may be artificial, not, not sound, not logical, but still you will come up with some reason to protect your stand. So that is dangerous. So therefore it is important when you get knowledge or education, it is really, really important to use your human mind carefully, not simply follow out of belief. The Buddha gave this beautiful teaching called Four Reliances. Four Reliances. That means when you listen to somebody, out of the word and the meaning, out of the word and the meaning, sorry, out of the person and the teaching, follow more of the teaching than the person. That means, do not simply follow somebody because the person is very famous. And normally we have this tendency, if somebody is famous, then everybody comes there, you see, just by the name. I'm not saying don't follow, you know, famous people, but all I'm saying is not follow them simply because they are famous. You go there, attend to his teachings, but the important thing is, listen properly to what he is teaching. So therefore, four reliances. That means out of the teaching and the teacher, follow more of the teaching than on the teacher, than on the fame and name of the teacher. And when you follow his teaching, then you should follow more of his meaning of the teaching than the word. The word may be very beautiful, but if there is not much meaning, and not very useful. So don't just look after the beauty of the world, but go after the meaning, follow the meaning. Second reliance. Third reliance. When it comes to understanding the meaning, follow more of the definitive meaning than the interpretative meaning. Because according to Buddhist teaching, it is said that the Buddha gave different teachings. Some are interpretative, some are definitive. He has to give the interpretative teaching also because not everybody will understand his ultimate teaching right away. So he has to give a teaching to a level that people can understand, which may be not the ultimate, not the definitive. So at the end of the day, out of these two teachings, you should follow the definitive teaching than the interpretative teaching. Now when that is the third reliance. And then the fourth reliance is that when it comes to understanding the definitive meaning of the teaching, 
follow more of the wisdom mind, wisdom mind, rather than the grosser level of consciousness. Okay? Not just the grosser mind, but try to use the subtle wisdom mind to precisely understand the meaning of the ultimate teaching. So through this way, what he's saying is that you should always use your mind and common sense and judge. And in fact, one very beautiful teaching that the Buddha gave was he said, O oh, bhikshus, O oh, bhikshus and the scholars, just as the goldsmith judges the gold by cutting, rubbing and putting under the fire, similarly well examine and judge my words and accept them and not because you respect me. So Buddha had kind of confidence in his teaching, saying that you analyze it, you judge it properly, not hurriedly. And then after that, if you find that my teaching is not realistic, not proper, not reasonable, you have every right to deny it. You do, there's no need for you to follow. Just like the goldsmith, who when he sees the purity of the gold, he has to do several tests, rub the gold, cut the gold, put it under the fire. Through After all this examinations, if you find that the gold is still gold, then of course you accept it and then you value it, regard it highly. So similarly, when it comes to understanding my teaching, you should also undertake these three processes of practice. The three processes, one, without just listening to others, you should see, you should yourself see, study, hear the teaching on those areas of teaching which you can directly understand. Use your common sense and understand that. Then there may be a second level of teaching which you cannot directly perceive with your eye or with your ear. So there you should again use your reason, inferential cognition, use your reason and find the truth of it. There may be a third level of teaching or third level of reality of nature which you cannot directly see, which you cannot caution or, you know, reason out. So those levels of teaching you should rely on, reliable statements of reliable people. Because there's no other way. Indirectly, yes, you can use some reason. But directly, there's no other way. But you can, you should use, and that's what we do in our daily life. For example, if I ask you, when were you born? Then you say, I was born on 15 August 1956. How do you know? Have you seen it? No, I didn't see it. Did you use logic? <laughs> no, I can't use my logic. So how did you find it out? My parents told me, see? You rely on the quotation, the statement of other people. My parents told me. Then indirectly you can use reason. How can you rely on your parents? because they are not going to get anything by telling my birth they are wrong. And moreover, they are very loving and very compassionate to me. So therefore, I trust what they said. You see? So there's the way, the three ways of finding the truth. So therefore, what I'm saying is, in one's life, it is very, very important not to simply follow a tradition blindly. This does not mean to say that you should not, you should, you know, should not have respect to the tradition because many people are following, okay, good, people are benefiting from it, okay. But in your case, you need to find out how far this sounds true. It's a tradition, it's religion, whatever. You need to, how, how, how good this is for humanity, what, what it is doing right now. Analyze carefully. Because at the end of the day, the one that will help you is one that is a result of your proper reflection proper thinking that will help you. Not, not not just by following some tradition. It will not help you. Okay? So therefore, as I said, the ignorance, the misconception of reality is the greatest source of all the miseries, all the afflictive emotions. And it is of two types, inborn and imagined, philosophical. Okay? Clear. So now out of all kinds of ignorances, the most destructive ignorance is called ignorance of seeing things as having 
independent existence. Now these are quite heavy subjects, so you need to think carefully. There are so many different types of ignorance, but the most destructive ignorance is the ignorance where you see everything as having independent existence. Clear? Now here you need to know things exist. Things exist, yes? Things exist. When things exist, there are only two alternatives, two possibilities for their existence. Either they should exist dependently or they should exist independently. There's no third possibility. Clear? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now these two, dependent existence and independent existence, they are mutually exclusive. One object cannot be both. It should either be dependent or independent. So now think carefully whether all these existing, existing phenomena are dependently existing or independently existing. What do you think? Dependent. Are you sure? Very sure about that. Everything that is existing exists dependently. <coughs> Are you sure about that? Yes. Then why people are asking for independence? <laughs> <laughs> because you cannot be independent. You can never be independent. You will have to depend on others. Of course, I mean, I'm playing with the word. <coughs> when countries say they want independence, different meaning. But the bigger meaning than that kind of independence is, the bigger meaning is that in true sense of the term, nothing can be independent. Everything is dependent upon each other, in one way or the other. So now when I ask you this question, you are all saying, everything has a dependent existence. You agree with me, you agree with the Buddhist teaching. But is this how we carry our life? No. That's the problem. <laughs> That's the problem, you see. When your eye is open, you are able to see things. But when you go around, if you close your eye, then you will fall, you see. It's like that, you see. So we forget about this reality that we are all interlinked, interconnected, interdependent. You, see? you are dependent on the environment, you are dependent on other people, other planet, other countries, so forth. You know. So once you understand this dependence on a larger scale, then you will find that you, you are just a small part and fraction of that big thing on which you are dependent. You are, you are as we say, a cog in the wheel. You know? So you need to play your part in this world of interdependent origination, okay? So once you understand this interdependence of everything, then you are able to develop this bigger picture, interconnectedness of everything. Now this is very clearly proved by the physicist, the scientists and others, they find that Sometimes they say that even when a bird flaps its swing on the other side of the world, it makes its ripple effect on the other side of the world. They say things like that. But whatever be the case, we do know that our very survival is in one way or the other dependent on so many causes and conditions. So therefore the Buddhist teaching says, the Buddhist teaching says that whatever you experience, Whatever you experience, your experience of happiness and suffering do not come from just one cause and one condition. <coughs> it comes from multiplicity of causes and conditions, wide variety of causes and conditions. And this, this is very helpful, particularly when you encounter some suffering. So normally we have this tendency 
that when you get, get some suffering, then you tend to pinpoint your finger to just one object. He is responsible for my suffering. She is responsible for my suffering. Only one. But the Buddhist teachings 